have a friend that lives in a suitcase. He's going to come out today. Um, just uh, here we go. It's, it's children's church in the grown-up service, so here we go. You ready? You, 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 you. you. Hey, how are you? All right. Well, this is, this is my friend. He's, he's, one, he's a new addition to the children's church, and I thought I'd bring him out today. Um, we're working this summer. We're doing a, a whole safari theme, and uh, this fella came all the way for, from Africa for us this week, and uh, he's going to be here during the summertime, and this is, um, it's, um, what is your name? If you don't know, how am I supposed to know? All right. Well, no, what is your name? My name is Pekka. Pekka. Paca, that's, that's a llama. I'm not a llama. I'm a lion. I know you're a lion, but you said you were a paca. No, 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 that's my name. Your name is Paca. Yeah. What does that mean? That means big cat. And I'm one big cat. Uh, you're, you're, you're not really that big. Yes, I am. I'm a real big dude. No, 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 no. That's right. Look, Pastor Andrew, I'm as big as you. Big guys stick together. Hey, what's that? Oh, that's a microphone. What's it do? Well, it sort of takes what you say and spreads it around so everybody can hear. Oh, it's a gossip. No, it's not a gossip. Does it work? Well, yeah, it works. Everybody can hear. Hello. Hello. It makes no difference. All right, let's stop it. All right, anyway. (laughs) Anyway, um. Your name is Paca. Yeah, it means big cat. Well, you're not really that big. Doesn't mean big as in size. It means I'm famous. You're famous. Detroit, I'm famous. I don't think I've ever heard of a a lion named Paca. I've heard of Mufasa. Ooh, say it again. (laughs) They are down here on our level. All right. Mufasa and Simba and uh, Lambert. I've never heard of Paca. Oh, you may not have heard my name, but I'm still famous. You're still famous. Why are you so famous? Because I worked for the king. You worked for the king? Yeah, you know, King Nebi. King Nebi? I don't know. You know, King Nebi. Nebi who? Nebi. You know, Nebi had a razor. Ne- oh, king Nebuchadnezzar. Yep, 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 that's the one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, has, has, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, huh? Yeah, I worked for him. Well, what did you do? Well, let's see, uh, I kind of got rid of things. You got rid of things. Yeah, 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 that was my job. I, I was in waste removal. <laughs> waste removal, okay. Uh, so you was a garbage man. No, 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 I didn't do that. Come on, man, I got pride. <laughs> Is this thing on? All right, so you got pride. All right, so waste removal then. If you weren't a garbage man, what would you? Well, let's just say if there was a trouble in the kingdom, the king would call me, and they'd bring that trouble make their, down there to where we were, and we'd take care of it. No more trouble. Okay, so you got rid of all the problems. Anytime the king came along, every problem that came along that they brought to you, you got rid of them all. Well, yeah. We mean, well, yeah. Well, we, we got a 99% average. You had a 99% average. Does that mean that somebody got away? Well, there was this one guy. Oh, there was one guy. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he really wasn't a troublemaker, though. He really wasn't a troublemaker. Then why did they bring him to you? Well, he was framed. He was framed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, one day we were down there, and we were just lying around. <laughs> well, you were just lying around, and, and then what happened? Well, they opened the door, and they threw this guy in. Yeah. And we got up, and we was going to go over there and just chomp down on him. But he was an old, scraggly fellow, so I, I was afraid that I wasn't going to do that. Why? Because I think he'd be tough. You know, them old fellers, they're pretty tough. All right, well, um, so he was old. Yeah. So he, they threw him in. You guys were about to do your job, and then what happened? Well, this great big old light came down, and a voice came out of the light. A voice came out of the light? Yeah, it said, don't eat him. Okay, the, the, the voice said, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I think it was an angel. Oh, okay. Hey, do angels play Halo? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that angels, I, I don't really even know what Halo is. It's a video game. Okay, I like to play it. It's in my suitcase. Where's my suitcase? Okay. Anyway, so the angel came down and told you not to eat them. Yep, so we got over there to see what was going on. Yeah. 
and he began to tell us what was happening. He said that, that he and his friends were captives from Babylon. They were captives from Babylon. Yep, but they worked for the king. They worked for the king too. So if he worked for the king, why was he uh, in, in the, the den where you was? Well, there were some guys that didn't like him. So they got the king to pass a law. The king passed a law. Said, yeah, it was, it was illegal for him to pray. So he did it anyway. Oh, so it was illegal for, for this fellow to pray, but he did it anyway. So I guess you could say his praying made him pray. You know, P R E Y. Get it? Pray. Oh, we got it. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> just leave the jokes to Johnny. Oh, you like Johnny? Yeah, but I wouldn't eat him. I'm afraid he'd taste funny. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Who needs Johnny? All right. Well, anyway, so, so he prayed, and they threw him in the dungeon or in the, the pit with you guys, and the angel told you not to eat them, eat him. So what happened? Well, he told us all kinds of stories that night. He did. Yeah, he told us stories of, of him and his friends and how they were eat from Israel and uh, uh, how they got captured and all the great things that had happened that God had moved them to a great position with the king, and that's what happened. Well, that, that is great. So, so you didn't eat him. No, I didn't eat him because he'd made me sick. Why would it have made you sick? Well, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> All right, that's enough. That's enough. Um, I'm going to put you away. No, 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 wait. I've got one more. You got what? I've got one more story. Well, what story is that? Well, it's the story of my shack, your shack, and a billy goat. <laughs> my shack. That, that's, that would be Shadrach, Meshach, and a billy goat. There, you said it wrong, too. All right, that's it. Come on, put you away. Actually, we are going to talk about Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego, but you have to go away now, okay? Where do I got to go? You got to go in the suitcase. It's dark in here. I know it's dark in here. What? It's dark in here. Don't shut the door. I got to shut the door. What? That was my tail. Oh, sorry. All right, get in there. What? Can I go have a glass of water? No water now. Get in there. Going to go to the bathroom later. (laughs) That was Packa. <laughs> Pastor Andrew mentioned to me some weeks ago, um, hey, hey, I'm doing this thing on narratives and on stories. And I said, oh, man, that's great. It's one of my favorite things is to do stories. In the children's world, we live in the story world. Everything's about the story. So he asked, uh, we got to talk, and I said, oh, man, that's great. What stories are you going to tell? And I, he said, oh, I'm going to try to find some of them ones maybe people don't know about. And he said, draw me a picture for the background. So I got to drawing the picture. Where, can we have the picture, the, the narrative background? There it is. And he said, draw me a picture of some stories that may not be well known. And he, he said, I said, what stories? He said, I don't know, just, just, just stories. So I began to drawing. And, uh, of course, we've got... Over here, we've got the staff that turned into the snake. And one of my favorite stories is the lion with the honey in it. I don't know if you know about Samson's story. And, and we got Daniel's uh, slingshot up there and the whale and the axe head. Now, I don't know what the bucket was for, Pastor. You asked me to do the bucket. I'm not sure what that one was. Oh, I missed it. Okay. See, in children's church, you don't get a lot of things. But anyway, today I want to talk to you about a story that I didn't get on the drawing. I want to talk to you about three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if you will, go with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Now we're doing, I'm also out of my uh, comfort zone. I'm normally not a, let's read, you know, because we got kids that don't read in children's church. So usually you just tell the story. But today we're going to kind of read it and talk about it at the same time. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. He, then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come and to the dedication of the statue that he set up. So all these officials came and stood before the king Nebuchadnezzar. Through, before the statue, King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Then 
the, a herald shouted, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow down to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses, will, oh, refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Wow. Okay, how many of you like parties? How many of you like to be left out of parties? No hands went up. Oh, one back there. You're like, oh, just don't invite me. Well, this was a party, and not everybody got to come to the party. Only the high-ups got to come to this party. This was the officials. This was the magistrates. This was the governors. This was a VIP party. Only, only the, the important people came. VIP party. These three men we're talking about today, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are captives. They're the, they, they are in enemy territory. They're captive. But it says the officials came to this party. What are captives doing at this party? It turns out that when we're God's people, no matter where we are, he's going to raise us to another level. So these captives now are not just captives down in a dungeon somewhere. They've been raised to be governors and officials. They, the king, here's the deal. The king went to, went to capture all these people. He captured all the Israelites in Judah, and he said, okay, I'm looking for some people that are smart hardworking, faithful, that I can train up to be servants in the kingdom. So he took these guys, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the, the whole crew, I like to call it Daniel and the boys, and they began to train them and lead them and guide them in the ways of the king. So he's called all the, all the officials together. They're going to have this great big party, and at this party he's got the bands. They've got all the music. How many of you have a favorite band? Come on, get that. And remember, we're in children's church. You've got to feed back to me now. Yeah, you have a favorite band. Get your hand up. Okay. What is your favorite band? Huh? One Direction. One Direction. All right. I mean, you can't go two directions at once. It's got to be One Direction. Come on, somebody else. I'm looking for bands. Favorite band? Skyhook. I don't know who they are. I don't have a comment about them. Somebody else, favorite band? Right here, what's your favorite band? Evanescence. Yeah, I hate it when my soda goes flat. It's got to have that evanescence in it. <laughs> okay. Usually, I, when I'm telling these kind of stories in children's church, I'll say, who's your band? And I get to find out what you guys listen to at home. Because I get answers that I know the Kids don't really know who these people are. I wouldn't chose to listen to them. I, I, honestly, I have told this story in children's church and got the answer, ACDC. <laughs> You're six. So, so, their favorite, so let's pretend that your favorite band happens to be the band that's here. Now, who you, you know, a lot of you, you're like, no, nah, I ain't raising my hand. He's going to come and ask me. But pretend your favorite band's here, and you got the VIP pass to come to the concert. How I many would be excited about that? Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm in, man. I got a VIP pass. Favorite band's here. You can get, maybe get to go backstage and meet them. Oh, how cool is this? So all the officials are here. The herald shouted, people of all races and nations, language, listen to the king. And when you hear the sound of your band. You are to fall on your knees, bow to the ground, worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses will be thrown in the fiery furnace. These guys came from Judah. They were, they were Israelites. They knew from the time they were wee little what it meant to serve the one true king. And now the world is telling them, you can't worship the one true king. You can't worship the one true God. You have to worship this giant statue. You see, here's the deal. The, the devil, he wants you to worship him. 
and he doesn't care whether it's true worship or it's false worship or it's forced worship. Whereas our God wants worship from the heart. These boys, they worship God from the heart. They didn't care what the world told them to do. They were worshiping from the heart. So our God says, worship me in spirit and truth. I'm not going to force you to. But here's the king forcing everybody to worship the statue. Let's go on. So the sound of the musical imp- so at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whether their rate, whatever their race, nation, language, bowed down to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They were tattletales. Hey, king, guess what? I'm going to tell on you. How many have a sibling and ever did ever said, I'm going to tell on you? It's these guys. I hate a tattletale. But these guys were tattletales. Informed on the Jews. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, live long. Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring that all the people bow down and worship the gold statue. And when you hear the sound of your favorite band, the decree also states that they, those that refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there were some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who you have put in charge of the providence of Babylon. Remember, these are kings, and they've been put in charge. Some people get jealous when our God moves us, when our God blesses us. He moved these young men from being captive to being in charge of Babylon, and now there's people that's jealous. Have you ever had somebody jealous of what God's done for you? I, I've I've run into that. Hey God, you gonna don't you won't believe what God did for me? Oh, that's great. You can believe he's talking about that again. It, people are gonna get jealous. So it says that they pay no attention to you, Your Majesty. They refuse to serve your gods. They do not worship the the gold statue that you set up. These guys, these magicians and astrologers and wise men, they were just, were just jealous, and they were looking for a way to get rid of Daniel and the boys. Later on, this is, this is before Daniel's story, but later on they get jealous of Daniel and they try to get rid of him. They try to make him cat chow. That's what they were trying to do. They were jealous and they were trying to get rid of him. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. When they were brought, be- brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to him, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods? or to worship the gold statue I have set up. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I, I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be um, thrown immediately into a blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve will save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty, or he rescue from your, your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods nor worship the golden statue you set up. It's one of my favorite lines in the Bible. If we are thrown into the furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. But, here it is, but even if he doesn't, we're going to do what's right no matter what. Even if he doesn't throw us into the furnace. Now, it's one thing to say, oh, our God can save us. But it's another thing to go, hey, maybe he won't. God is God, and he can choose to do whatever he wants to do. Maybe he doesn't want to save us from the furnace. Well, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should bow. No, no, no. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Even if he doesn't. 
our faithfulness should not be precluded on what God can do for us, but upon who he is. Our worship to God isn't worship because of what he has done. It's worship because of who he is. We worship him because he is God. We praise him because of what he's done. You see, praise and worship are two different things. Our former pastor taught me this, and I I love it. He says, worship goes this way, me to God. Praise goes this way. I tell you what God has done for me. I am praising him by telling you what God has done for me. But I worship him by thanking him for who he is and praising him for who he is. So what God does for what God does for me does not mean how I serve him. I serve him whether he's done anything for me or not. These guys said it doesn't matter if he saves us, it doesn't matter if he takes us out of the furnace, it doesn't matter if he keeps you from throwing it, we're going to serve God. Let's move on. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. The man was upset. The man was ticked. My father was one of those men that never disciplined the children. It was always mom's job until it built up so much that he exploded. Then it didn't matter if it was your fault or not. Everybody in the house gets a whooping. But he, he, you could tell when dad, you know, dad was just a little upset, he'd give you that look. And then it would build. And then the next time something would build on that. And pretty soon, man, that vein comes out on his head. And it's a throbbing and his face is red. And this vein, you knew that was it. That's the face Nebuchadnezzar's got now. He is furious. He has reached that level. These boys have already, they've looked him in the face and defied him. They've talked back to him. That's it. You're out of here. He commanded the, was so firm, so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted with rage. He commanded the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men in his armies to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. They tied them up, threw them into the furnace, fully dressed, their pants, their turbans, their robes, their other garments, and because the king was in his anger, he demanded such a hot fire in the furnace that the flame killed the soldiers as they threw the men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. The fire was so hot that the men that were just getting close to it died. Pastor Andrew was, is uh, working on a mic upstairs this morning. He's got his soldering iron out. And he's working on these little bitty wires. He, ah, ow! And he's telling me, I burnt my fingers trying to do this little bitty wire. Hot. Have you ever burned yourself? Oh, man. Uh, was it last year, I guess it was, last spring, I was working on the science stuff trying to decide what tricks to do with the kids in the science thing we were doing. And there's this one thing called the whoosh bottle, and it's this great big five-gallon bottle. You put this, this certain chemical in, and you light it, and it whoosh, and it does this really cool, oh, it's awesome, it's really cool. Oh, I saw it on YouTube. This is going to be great. The kids are going to love it. So I put the stuff in there, and I didn't have a match. The thing said had, you're supposed to drop a match in there, and bah, I got a little big lighter. It'll be okay. <laughs> I'm calling Johnny. Hey, uh, Johnny, uh, you're the only one here. I need somebody to take me to the doctor. Uh, third degree burns are not good. Fire is not your friend. These guys, it's so hot that they can't even get to the furnace. They had to toss them in, and then they fell dead. Seven times honor. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, I'm about to do this little trick here. And uh, it's truly not one of the safest tricks I've ever done. I will admit that I did burn a church down doing this trick. Honest to goodness. I now have a fire extinguisher, but pastor said don't use it. He said if it burns, let it burn. (laughs) So, fire seven times hotter. They've thrown the guys in. (laughs) 
Oh, I was going to put my gloves on. Forgot. <laughs> Too late now. Here, hold this. <laughs> fire is seven times higher. They've, they've thrown them in. They're in the fire. Okay, Roy, get your thing back up here so you can read. I'm not used to reading and doing this. I usually just tell the story. Um, so they tied them through the fire. When we put our faith into action, it sends our enemy into a tizzy. He, the enemy was in a tizzy. The king was mad. He's thrown these guys in the fire. He thought that he was going to get rid of his trouble. He was going to throw these guys in fire. That's it. I'm done. I'm shown that I'm king. These guys defiled me in front of everybody. They've shown that I don't have the authority. That's it. I'm throwing them in the fire. That'll show who has authority. When the enemy sees you acting upon your faith, it throws him into a tizzy. You see, the enemy wasn't mad at you when you weren't serving God. You you pose no threat to him. But the instant you invite Christ into your life and you get your life moving in the direction of God, you're doing something for the kingdom, now he's got somebody that's opposing him. So he's looking for a way to throw you into the furnace. He's looking for a way to get rid of you because you're a troublemaker. Well, the kings throw these three troublemakers into the fire. Excuse me. Fire. Thank you. See, one of the kids would say, oh, hold it for you. Put your gloves on. And I'd say, okay. No, I wouldn't. So, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in an amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Oh, yes, your majesty, certainly we did. We threw those three boys, those troublemakers, we threw them into the furnace. He's throwing them into the furnace. The fire's blazing in the furnace. Yes, king, we threw them into the furnace, just like you said. Joe and Bob, they died doing it, but we did what you king, what you said, O oh king. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men walking around. Hey, the king can count. I see four men. We threw three in there, and I see four men. That fourth man looks like the son of God. Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Wait a minute, now he's changing his tune. Servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. God did not deliver these men from the furnace. He went through it with them. God doesn't always deliver you from your problems in life. But he will go through them with you. I've had problems in my life and I've said, God, I don't know how, how I'm going to get through this. And then there's been times I've went, God, why have you abandoned me? I, I have done everything. I've committed my life to you. My entire everything is you. I've given you everything, God. Why have you? Oh, wait a minute. It's not that you've delivered me from the furnace. You're here with me in it. He looks at the furnace and he sees four men. God was there with them. So they come out of the furnace. And here's my favorite part. They come out of the furnace. And there's no smell of fire on them. The rocks that were bound them are gone. There's no singed hair. There's nothing. God had delivered them from the furnace. When we put our faith in action for God, he goes through that with us and he protects us. His protection is there, just like it was for the Hebrew children. There's no, our handkerchief went through the fire. You saw it. I burned it twice. There's no burn. When we put God first in our life, he sees us through it. Let's, let's go a little bit further here. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. You can tell a smoker. They smell like it. I ordered something off eBay. If you do any eBay shopping, you want to look for If you buy something that's cloth, I bought a... A stuffed animal, and I forgot to look. It didn't say this comes from a non-smoking home. That thing, I've had it for three years and have drenched it in all the Febreze that I could get. It still smells. When you're around fire and smoke, it gets in your clothes. Not even the smell of smoke was upon them. When he threw them into the fire, he thought he was destroying a threat to his authority but all he destroyed was the rope that bound them. The devil wants to destroy you, but he can't do anything. He's trying to destroy you when you are working for the king, when you are living for the king, when you're working for building the kingdom. All that can happen is those things that bind you can fall off. Are you bound by something? Is there something that the devil has that he's trying to bind you with? Through God, all, all that can happen is those bondages can fall off. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, He's to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants whom trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die than rather to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any Whatever their race or nation or language speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, their houses to be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to higher positions. These guys were jealous of them, were going to get rid of them, and what happened? They got promoted even higher because they acted on their faith. You see, faith faith requires an action. How many of you who came in today worried about whether the seat would hold you? Anybody? You come in and go, oh, 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 got to make sure that this seat's strong. How many of you just sat down? You just sat down. Why? Because you used your faith. You had faith that the seat would hold you. You didn't think about it. You did it. You acted upon your faith. You see, faith is a muscle. And as long as you exercise your muscles, they'll get stronger. If I don't use my arm and I just let it hang there, six months later, I'm not going to be able to use my arm because it's, it's atrophied. I can't. Well, faith is the same way. The more we act upon faith, the stronger it gets. Faith requires actions. Noah built the boat. Did Noah start building the boat once he saw a rain cloud? No, he, he, he built it before. He acted upon it. Abraham. Abraham acted on faith. He took Abraham or took Isaac to the mountain, laid him on the thing, lift up his hand. He had the knife there. He was acting upon his faith. It wasn't until he acted that God moved. It wasn't him, okay, I'm going to go take Isaac to the mountain. Isaac's like, oh, I see the fire, I see the wood, where's the sacrifice? I got news for you. If I was Isaac, I'd been heading the other way. But God took him, tied him up and put him on the altar and he raised his hand. Then God moved. God saw his faith by his actions. When Moses face the, the, the Red Sea. He's, he's got water on one side. He's got the Egyptians on the other. No place to go. He stepped out in faith. He stepped down into the water. The water didn't part till he stepped out. Your faith has to have actions. These, God, these guys said, I don't know if God's going to save me or not, but we're going to do what's right. We're going to step out on our faith. We're going to act upon our faith. If you want to see God do something in your life, you have to step out in faith. You have to work. Faith without works is dead. You can have all the faith you want, but not exercise it. It's not going to get you anywhere. 
You've got to step out in faith. You got a financial problem in your life? Be faithful in giving. Simple as that. Does that mean that God's going to, if I put $5 in the plate today and tomorrow I'm going to be? No. But God is faithful. He's going to bless your actions. You got a relationship problem? I've done everything I can. I'm giving up. You know, no, that's not how it works. Ask my wife. That's not how it works. It's a struggle for her to love me sometimes. But she keeps on loving. She keeps on loving. I keep on loving. Does that mean that the other party in that relationship is going to instantly turn around? I I don't know. I don't know if God's going to take us out of the fire. I don't know if God's going to make that relationship perfect. But I do know it requires faith on your part and action on your part. What are you facing in your own story today, in your own narrative? What's going on in your life? Do you need to see God move in your story? Then you need to move your faith. If you want to see God move, you got to move. And if you've got kids, then you're going to know this reference. You got to move it, move it. It's one of my favorite lines. We watched Madagascar 3 Wednesday night, and uh, at the end of the movie, there it is. You've got to move it, move it. You do. You've got to move your faith. I can't say I've got faith and then worry about everything. I've got to say I've got faith, and I'm going to step out, and I'm going to trust God with it. I'm going to bring it to the altar. I'm going to lay it. Abraham brought it to the altar. He laid Isaac there. By faith, he stepped out. By faith, he moved. It was an action on his part. God doesn't move until you move. We see it in the Bible all over the place. Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Samson. Well, Samson, let's talk. Samson says that they, they, they cut off his hair, and what did he do? He got up and he shook himself. He was used to moving on that faith. He was used to acting upon it. There were some things that negated the the power of God moving in him because he didn't live his life faithfully, but it says he got up and he shook himself. He was used to moving on his faith. You got to move on your faith. You got to move it, move it. (music) 